So that's number one, large number of organizations monitoring the situation. Number two, human rights law is a relatively recent body of international law. And that means there's a lot of gray areas. The application of terms, the uh, meanings of terms, for those of you who read this sort of stuff, uh, it's a very complicated process. What does each word mean? Uh, and in the case of human rights law, they're just now defining the meanings of these words. Uh, for those of you who follow the conflict now, even expressions like human shield, what does it mean? Does it mean voluntarily? Does it mean conscripting somebody? Does it mean uh, standing near somebody? Uh, it's complicated. Uh, and then a lot of human rights law is, is very vulnerable, susceptible to human uh, error, human flaw. Uh, what does that mean? A lot of human rights work consists of going to a demonstration, looking at who shot first, were there warning shots, uh, were there was live, was there live ammunition, so on and so forth. And for those of you who know the famous Kurosawa film, Rashomon, uh, you know that there is a lot of possibility for people to see the same incident and remember it differently. Well, uh, I had occasion for the last book I wrote to go through about 20, pay, excuse me, 20 years of human rights reports. And that was literally thousands and thousands of pages of human rights reports. I was expecting, based on the uh, reasons I just recited, the multiplicity of organizations, the gray areas in human rights law, the susceptibility of people to remembering things differently. I was expecting that there would be lots of controversy about what happened when in the course of the Israel-Palestine conflict over the last 20 years. What happened at this demonstration? What happened at that clash? And I can tell you without fear of contradiction, and if a polygraph were put on my wrist right now, I'm sure it wouldn't miss a beat. Over a 20-year period, thousands of pages of human rights reports, I only found one incident, literally one, one demonstration on one afternoon, one day in Hebron, where two human rights organizations disagreed about what happened. There's no controversy at all on what the real human rights record is. Well, what is the record? Jimmy Carter puts it in as mild a form as you can get nowadays. He says, in order to perpetuate the occupation, Israeli forces have deprived their unwilling subject of basic human rights. That seems pretty understated if you look at the actual record. Let's look at one example, the one that usually gets the most attention, whether deservedly or not, I can't say, or namely the question of fatalities. As everybody in this room knows, in January, 9, January 2006, the Palestinians elected a new government led by the Islamic movement Hamas, and immediately led by the United States, the Western governments imposed several conditions on Hamas in order to get recognition. Uh, and short of getting that recognition, uh, the U.S. and Western governments imposed a brutal uh, sanctions policy against the occupied territories. Uh, basically, the purpose being to um, uh, starve the Palestinians into submission. Uh, for those of you who've seen the latest United Nations report, stating about half the population is now undernourished in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the tactic seems to be working quite successfully. Well, what's the rationale for these brutal sanctions that have been imposed? There are basically three conditions put on Hamas. Number one, that Hamas has to renounce terrorism. Uh, and that to me seems perfectly reasonable. It's illegal under international law to target civilians for political ends. And Hamas is duty bound under international law to renounce terrorism. That to me is uncontroversial. It is, as they used to call it, a no-brainer. Uh, the problem becomes, I think, the problem becomes when a uh, demand is imposed on one side and not on the other. 
So you take the case of Israel, one of Israel's former leading jurists, uh, Shabtai Rosen. He said at one point, one of the effective principles, excuse me, one of the fundamental principles for the effective operation of international law in any circumstances is the principle of reciprocity. The rules of international law are abstractions until they come to be recipro reciprocally applied to concrete cir uh, circumstances. All right, that seems pretty reasonable. Has to be reciprocity. We're now demanding that the Palestinian government renounce terrorism. So let's look at the record and let's see if that principle, that fundamental principle of reciprocity is being applied. The most recent statistics by Bet Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territory, state that 4,046 Palestinians have been killed during the Second Intifada since September 28, 2000, and 1,017 Israelis, a ratio of about 4 to 1. You break it down further, the human rights organizations state that on both sides, the overwhelming majority of those killed were civilians. So roughly four times as many Palestinian civilians as Israeli civilians have been killed in the last six years. But some of you are thinking, familiar with the usual mainstream claims, but isn't there a difference between Palestinians targeting Israeli civilians and Israel unintentionally killing Palestinian civilians. That's the usual claim that's made. Palestinians are targeting Israeli civilians. The Palestinian deaths due to Israel are unintentional. Or as Jeffrey Goldberg, the current New Yorker staff writer on the Middle East, uh, in his recent book, Prisoners, he says at one point, for God's sake, we don't try to kill children. An unf a familiar argument. <clears throat> well, what's the record? The record is this. 811, since September 28, 811 Palestinian children have been killed. That's more than the total number of Israeli civilians killed. On the Israeli side, it's a total number of 711 civilians killed, of whom 100 were children, the ratio being about 8 to 1 children killed. In the year 2006, this past year, 141 Palestinian children were killed as compared to 17 Israeli civilians, the total number, of whom exactly one was a child. So the ratio for the past year was 141 to 1. So to begin with, we can say, for the want of trying to kill Palestinian children, it would seem that Israelis were awfully good at it. Number two, according to human rights organizations, unarmed Palestinian demonstrators were, now I'm quoting Amnesty, on many occasions deliberately targeted. So if we limit ourselves narrowly to the question of intentionality, Amnesty says, on many occasions, Palestinian children were deliberately targeted. And then it goes on to say, or human rights organizations generally go on to say, while in other cases, Israel used indiscriminate, excessive, and disproportionate force. Now, as it happens under international law, these deaths from indiscriminate, excessive, and disproportionate force these deaths are no different than intentional killings. Let me quote to you Israel's leading authority in international law, a very smart guy, uh, the president of Tel Aviv University, Yoram Dinstein. He addresses, he's written several of the classic textbooks in the question of the laws of war. And in one of his textbooks, he writes, quote, there is no genuine difference between a premeditated attack against civilians, which is what Hamas is accused of, and reckless use of force, which is what Israel is accused of. 
He then says, colon, they are equally forbidden. Well, after going through that, the details, what's the bottom line? As far as I could see, the bottom line is, the only differences between Israeli and Hamas terrorism are one, Israeli terrorism is four times as lethal. And two, no demand has been put on Israel to renounce terrorism. That is the basic principle of reciprocity, according to Shabtai Rosen. The basic principle of reciprocity is ignored in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict. 